Good evening and welcome back to uh, Vegas October 1 Sounds. Tonight I'm going to do a reading uh, of a, a summary of Gunshot Acoustics paper authored by uh, Robert C. Mayer at, Montana, Mayer at uh, Montana State University. This is not his usual format of papers, so this is probably a rather informal paper presented to students in a class or something like that. His normal form is is dual column, dual column IEEE standard format. But anyway, the objective tonight is to read this with you so that I can explain how one electrical engineers think and write and what explains some of the technical terms. And this will be useful when you start reading any of my papers because I, I use the same style. So let's go ahead and get started here. <coughs> so we're talking about sound and gunshots. So he makes the statement here that uh, an audio recording of, a, of gunshots can provide information. So we're talking about rec audio recordings, we're talking about gunshots, and we're talking about what kind of information we can get from them about the gun location. And he uses the word can meaning that it doesn't have to or won't always. And the information we're going to get about the gun location is relative to the microphones. That is, the, the, the positioning of the gun will be relative and described as something from the uh, position of the microphones. And these recordings can also tell us about the speed and trajectory of the pro projectile. So, it doesn't tell us anything about the nature of the quality of the recordings or anything, so it's kind of a, 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 a not sketchy, but uh, limited statement. And then he asserts that the principal difficulty, i.e. the major obstacle when you're listening to audio recordings and you want to extract gunshot information, uh, is an ma major the principal difficulty when interpreting, and immediately here this is this raises a flag because normally engineers don't interpret they build. So what he's saying here is that this is a qualitative process that listening to and analyzing a recording is a qualitative process. If it were a uh, slam dunk black and white science, he would have used different words. <clears throat> so we're going to interpret this recording, and he says the major problem arises from one, reverberation. Well, reverberation is nothing more than the term we use when there's so many reflections that they're difficult to decipher. And in this case, he refines it as overlapping acoustic signal reflections, which is basically the same thing. Um, if you fire a gun inside of a closed room, you're going to get you know reflections off multiple surfaces, and even one reflection off one wall will then bounce to the other side and back and forth until the signal dies down, and that's what we call reverberation. And he says, due to the gunshot sound, well, which gunshot sound? Because a gunshot sound, there's more than one of them, reflecting off and diffracting around nearby surfaces. I think everybody understands what a reflection is. You look in the mirror, that's a reflection. Uh, the light, you know, hits your face from a light bulb or something and reflects off your face, hits the mirror, and comes back to your eyes. And diffracting. Diffracting is a whole nother can of worms. Diffraction refers to a process where a wave phenomena encounters an object and actually moves around it. Um, and to understand this process, you have to understand what we call the wavelength of the uh, wave. And that wavelength is nothing more than the measurement from the peak of one crest to the peak of the next crest. And for sound, the wavelength ranges from, you know, a few centimeters to a few feet. And so, for example, the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. 
lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength. <coughs> and in the case of uh, low frequencies, the wavelength being some multiple of feet, that wave, that low frequency wave, when it encounters an object that is smaller than the wavelength, let's say um, a lamp post, its width is, you know, probably not much more than a foot, and the low frequency's wavelength is multiple feet, therefore it will worm its way around it, and at anywhere downstream from that, it, you won't even see the lamp post. Contrast that to a high frequency. Uh, sound which has a wavelength of a centimeter or two let's say and it encounters that same light pole the light pole is multiple w widths of the wavelength and it won't diffract around it it will reflect off of it and so uh, this is the basic phenomena that you'll see in, in gunshot ac activity because uh, muzzle blasts are lower frequency and uh, the supersonic cracks are higher frequency. So the, the supersonic cracks will actually reflect and they won't go around. The muzzle blasts will encounter objects and they'll diffract around. So on that phenomenon alone, the muzzle blasts will, you know, have a, a, an easier time of getting to places and create fewer reflections than uh, a corresponding high frequency supersonic snap. Okay, so in the first paragraph, he said that, you know, we can tell something about uh, the position of the shooter and the speed of the bullet and its trajectory by listening to audio recordings. Not always, but sometimes. And that the biggest problem in interpreting these things is caused by reflections and uh, diffraction. In other words, the signal gets mucked up because of those things. So then he goes on to talk about muzzle blast. Now the muzzle, let's see, is he going to describe it here? Yeah, I'll just read it. He says, a conventional firearm uses a confined explosive charge to propel the bullet out of the gun barrel. Yeah, I think everybody probably understands that. The hot, rapidly expanding gases cause an acoustic blast to emerge from the barrel. Okay, so the gases from the powder in, in, the, bull, in, the, in the round you know, get done pushing the bullet out of the barrel and they come out. And, and we call it an acoustic blast. Uh, the This acoustic disturbance lasts, we're talking about the muzzle blast now, three to five milliseconds. Uh, in gunshot sound land measurements, that's a long time. And a millisecond is one one thousandth of a second. And this acoustic disturbance propagates through the air. So what is propagation? Well, that means how it moves from one point to the next. And it's called propagation because there's a lot of complex physics involved. Uh, sounds are compression waves. A compression wave is like a slinky. You know, you could stretch it apart and bring it back together, but it moves from one, you know, the, any of the movement will go from one end of the slinky to the next regardless of what shape the slink, slinky is taking. And sound does a similar thing, and it's using the molecules of the air as the steel of the sprinkly to, to move from one end to the next. So in a slinky, energy is transferred from one side, from one end to the next, through the steel coils, and in sound, the energy is transferred from uh, one molecule to the next, you know, from the source to wherever the you know it ends up being. All right, and it propagates through the air, which is the medium that the sound travels in, at the speed of sound. And we're going to label that with a little symbol called c. So wherever you see this little c here, they're referring to the speed of sound. Now you notice he hasn't qualified this speed of sound thing. He doesn't tell us anything about what the speed of sound is or anything. So we'll just leave it at that for the moment. But what he does say is the sound level of the muzzle blast, which are these exploding gases coming out the end of the barrel, and their impact upon the air, 
is strongest in the direction the barrel is pointing and decreases as the off-axis angle increases. Okay, a couple of terms there, off-axis and angle. So what he's saying is that this muzzle blast or these exploding gases that are coming out the end of the barrel in, you know, cause disturbances in the in the medium, which is the air, and they're loudest directly in front of the barrel and along that line coming straight out, and they're weakest at uh, any angle that yeah, and as the as the listener moves away from the the barrel of the gun at an angle, then that the sounds become weaker. Eh, kind of okay. Okay. So we've described one type of sound here, and that's the muzzle blast, and it's caused by gases coming out the barrel. It's a one-time deal, and while it may continue to propagate throughout the entire region. Uh, it's a one-time deal and in fact it propagates as I described in video 2 in a sphere away from the the end of the gun barrel so now we're going to talk about shock waves and uh, project supersonic projectiles supersonic me sonic meaning faster than the speed of sound which you know the speed of sound changes with temperature so you have to know what the temperature is to figure out what supersonic means in terms of actual numbers. All right. Depending upon the size of the charge, okay, you got a big bullet or a small bullet. I don't bullet. Bullet is a bad word. You have a big shell casing or a small shell casing in which you can stuff the powder. So depending upon the, how much powder we use and how big the bullet is and other factors. Okay, well... <laughs> You know, when an engineer says other factors, he really is winging it because he doesn't want to tell you or have to go into the detail and explain the complexities of the other factors. Um, the bullet may, may meaning not always be traveling at, at supersonic speed. So here he permits himself uh, to say that not all bullets from not all from all rounds are going to travel faster than speed around even if they're in uh, I think are we talking about rifles here no we're not so that's why he qualifies it because pistols don't typically travel supersonic anyway if you have a supersonic bullet it causes a, a characteristic shock wave pattern as it moves through the air so what he's saying by characteristic here is that all these supersonic bullets produce a well-known pattern as they travel through the air Tra or travel moves is a better moves through the air and we call this a shock wave and the shock wave expands as a cone a cone now not a sphere behind the bullet okay so we're already getting kind of technical here with the wave front what's the wave front that's the leading edge of the wave. So this leading edge of the wave is is moving outward at the speed of sound. Okay, so we got two speeds here. One is the speed of sound at that temperature and the other is the, is the speed of the bullet which to be supersonic has to be faster than the speed of sound. So we got two speeds here and speed is, you know, just a value, not a vector, not a a vector is, you know, magnitude and direction. So you got to be careful here. When when an engineer uses speed, he means speed, just the magnitude, not the direction. So regardless of which direction this wave front is propagating, it's 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 expanding outward, just like the the sphere would, but in this case, it's a cone expanding out at the speed of sound. Okay, the shock wave cone has an interior angle interior meaning measured from the point from the bullet's trajectory outward and it's given by okay and so these are just greek symbols we look, it's, us, us engineers love greek symbols everybody loves greek symbols right <laughs> theta with a sub uh, a sub note of uh, muzzle equals the arc sine of 1 over the mach angle where the Mach, or Mach, Mach, where Mach is uh, the ratio of the speed of the bullet to the speed of sound, and they call it the Mach number. 
Okay, so up here we we know, we calculate the speed of sound, or you know we know the speed of sound, and we have a supersonic bullet, and we denote that speed of the supersonic bullet as m, and to figure out the interior angle, we're going to take the ratio one over m, and run it through the arc sine, which is just the inverse function of the a trigonometric sine. So if I have you know, an angle of 30 degrees, and I take the sine of it, then get a number. The arc sine will take that number and convert it back to 30 degrees. Okay, so here we've got a couple of terms introduced, but the most important is called the Mach number, and that's why it's italicized. And he says, this geometry is shown in one. All right, good, finally, a picture. We'll come back to these, and now let's go look at the picture. Here's figure one. All right, so what do we have here? We have a bullet moving from left to right. Here's the bullet as it travels forward. And we have a velo he calls it a velocity V. Eh, I kind of believe that's speed, not velocity. But anyway, we'll call it a V for a vector. Uh, we know its magnitude and we know its direction. In this case, the direction is left to right and its magnitude is yet to be specified. Okay. And here we see theta m, the the um, Mach angle, as we'll call it, and its interior, it's relative to the trajectory of the bullet. So it's measured from the bullet to the leading edge of the, the shock wave cone. <coughs> and it, you notice it's only really one half of the distance of the angle between this side and this side. Or put another way, uh, the shock cone is symmetrical about the the uh, trajectory, trajectory of the bullet. And we're only going to need to measure half the angle from side to side. Alright, let's see what else we've got here. Shockwave cone. Okay. Now, this leading edge here of this cone is moving in this direction along what we call the normal vector to the cone. Uh, at the speed of sound. And you say your shock wavefront. Leading edge of the cone is the shock wavefront and it's traveling at the speed of sound. Now this is a, a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional phenomena. And uh, these lines here are really uh, circling the entire cone because even as we look at this this cone is expanding directly from from the plane of this page into my eyes. And it's doing the same thing on the opposite side of the cone, and it's doing it on the top of the cone, the bottom of the cone, and all the points in between. Okay, now in terms of formulas, these are pretty straightforward. The Mach number, as he says, is m, and it can be calculated as the speed of the bullet, who cares which direction it's going over the speed of sound. Okay, that's simple. Then we could take that and plug it into here. Take one over the one over it as the ratio, and then plug it into the function or the inverse function of the sine, and we will now have this angle. So you can go either direction. If you know the angle, you can get this value, and if you have this value, you can get the angle. Okay, now in this setup here, we're, he's going to put a couple of microphones. He hasn't said anything about them yet, but that's what it is. This type of diagram I'll be using a lot of times, uh, so it's important to understand this. And it's important to realize that this is a simple 2D uh, image of a, of a three-dimensional uh, phenomenon. And I'll be doing a video soon and uh, in 3D and letting you look at that. All right, so let's go back to reading what he says. All right, with a very fast bullet. What the hell is a very fast bullet? <laughs> I thought they were all pretty fast. <laughs> so I don't know why I put that in there, but anyway, uh, the Mach number is large. Mach number large. Okay. Let's say we got a, a fast bullet traveling at 10,000 feet per second. This is just a ridiculous example because I don't know of any bullets that do that. But let's say we do it. 
let's say this bullet's traveling at 10,000 feet per second and let's say the speed of sound is a thousand feet per second then the ratio of 10,000 over 1,000 is 10 and that would be the Mach number and that would indeed be a very fast bullet uh, <clears throat> so M is large so he's stating the obvious but he's stating it for a reason and uh, that the uh, Mach angle becomes small well duh you know as the ratio anyway uh, causing the shock wave to propagate nearly perpendicularly to the bullet's trajectory now that's a statement which we need to go back to the diagram here so the faster the bullet is the smaller the angle okay so Let's see if he stated that correctly. Yeah, this, how, so he's describing how the shock wave uh, propagates. Okay, so as this angle becomes small, in this example here, we, we have a small angle. And the propagation direction of the, w the leading edge of this cone is this direction. Okay? Now you notice that's not the same direction as the direction of the bullet. If this angle were to become zero, then we'd have a leading edge that was identical to the trajectory of the bullet, and therefore this number would be perpendicular or form a 90 degree angle there. I hope that makes sense. But typically we don't have 10,000 feet per second or better uh, bullets. In fact, you know, a standard 223 round with a 50 or 5 grain uh, bullet in it is coming out of a 20 inch barrel at, uh, let's say, 80 degrees that night. We're probably going to have um, uh, a speed of sound of, let's say, 1200 feet per second, and we're probably going to have a bullet velocity of, uh, I don't know, let's say, 3 feet. Uh, let's let's make it easy. So three times. Well, let's let's say we can get up as high as 3,600 feet per second. So in that case, with 3,600 feet per second bullet and the speed of sound being 1,200 feet per second at 80 degrees, we're going to get a Mach angle, a Mach number of three. All right. And this and that will uh, let's see for a Mach angle of three. This is about right for a Mach angle of three you know somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 degrees so let's go back and see what he's saying all right yeah so he's going to give himself an example okay so he says we got oh close to 3,000 there we go for example you see I told you engineers think alike we're going to try to make this a something near a whole number but anyway he says for a bullet traveling at 3,000 feet per second at room temperature whatever that is has a Mach number equal to 2.67. Let's see, where did we find to find the speed of sound? Did I miss that somewhere? Or is he just going to try to wing it here? He's trying to wing it. Hmm. This is a very informal paper. Okay, so anyway, he says uh, at room temperature, but he doesn't state what room temperature is, uh, we're going to have a Mach of 2.67. Mach number 2.67 and we, when we take and plug that into the arc sign we get a, a Mach angle of 22 degrees. So then he's going to take it in reverse. On the other hand if the bullet is only slightly, oh no he's not, he's going to describe another condition. On the other hand if the bullet is only slightly faster than the speed of sound meaning that the bullet is traveling approximately the speed of sound then, then the Mach number is approximately unity. Oh, good. Unity. Unity is one. And uh, the Mach angle, theta m, is nearly 90 degrees. Okay, that's worth worth uh, talking about. We go down here. If we have a bullet that bullet that is just barely supersonic, then uh, this Mach cone becomes so wide that the leading edge is out here, and it's almost up and down, forming a, a straight line such that as the bullet travels forward all points ahead intercept the uh, shock cone 
not really a cone, but a line in this, at the same time. So as the bullet slows down, the mock cone spreads, this angle becomes larger and it's and the leading edges from side to side spread apart. Okay, and this, the, the direction of travel, becomes closer and closer to the direction of travel of the bullet. So as this edge becomes, as this angle increases, the leading edge moves out this way, this vector starts pointing in the same direction of the bullet. So that's good enough. In summary to that little thing, the mock angle or the, or the the spread of the cone becomes larger as the bullet is faster. It's an inverse relationship. And as the bullet becomes uh, faster, the mock, cone, mock angle decreases. So fast, little angle, large, big angle. That's all he's saying. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to talk about microphones. He says if two or more microphones are located at known locations, okay, so we're going to talk about the recording microphones and we're going to know their location within the path of the shock wave. Well, no, no, that's an interesting thing to talk about. In this example, this the bullet is traveling this way and it's continually generating new shock waves all along and uh, this cone back here is expanding wider and wider and wider. But if you put a microphone over here, the, sh the, uh, the cone expanding out this way is never going to theoretically reach it. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little later. Okay. The, okay, so if we have microphones which are in the path of the shot cone, which is a forward-moving phenomena, so if you have something behind it, you're not going to record it because it's not there. It doesn't travel that direction. It doesn't move that direction. It doesn't propagate that direction. Uh, then we, the time of arrival differences. Okay, so you got two microphones, and this, the uh, depending upon how they're located, the the shock wave front is going to hit them at different times. In this case, since they're different distances from the front of it, then it arrives to them at different times. However, if this microphone had been moved right over along this line, then they are e equal distance from the shock wave front, and it would arrive at the same time. So placement of the microphones is crucial. Now in this case I don't know why he didn't make these this calculation a little easier because if this microphone had been moved to the right a little bit it would be parallel to the uh, shock wave front trajectory and it would be a much easier calculation to perform. But anyway. Okay. And this time of difference can be used to estimate the shock's propagation direction. Okay, I think he's pretty much stating the office, uh, obvious, but we'll review it anyway. He says that if we know the distance between here and there, then as these waves encounter we can calculate the speed between the two. In this case it's going to have to be a trigonometric function because, as I was pointed out earlier, this line is not parallel to that, so you have to measure um, the distance down and the distance over. All right. And then you notice he uses the word estimate. That means there's some gotchas there. Okay, he says note, however. Okay, here come the problems. The that determining the bullet's trajectory from shock propagation vectors, now that's a very specific term here, engineer vector is, is a word that means something to engineers. It means that you're measuring something, somebody's speed, and you're measuring their direction. So, for example, if you're traveling down the road at 60 miles per hour, that's speed. Uh, if you're saying, but if you say I'm traveling north at at 60 miles an hour, that's a vector because it has both a speed and a direction, 
or magnitude and direction, if you will. So get careful here when he starts using the word vector. Okay, so back up here. He says that determining the bullet's trajectory from the shock propagation vector, shock propagation vector. Okay. What does he mean by that? That means I would take that to mean this this little thing here. Okay, it sounds like he's making it over complex. But anyway. Uh, so we got this that requires knowledge of the bullet velocity. Yes. And we're going to call bullet velocity V. Velocity is a vector because it has a magnitude and a direction. If this velocity is not known, then M, the Mach number, and the Mach angle are also not known, and the bullet's trajectory cannot be determined exactly without additional spatial information. Yeah, that's what I was just referring to. In this case, since the dis these microphones are aligned along a line that is not parallel to the direction of travel of the shock wave front, then we have to know how much they're separated relative to this, which would require knowing the bullet vector, and vice versa. However, if he had moved this microphone over here to the right a little bit, such that uh, it was parallel to the uh, velocity vector of the, the shock wave front, then it would have been a much easier calculation. Oh well. <clears throat> okay, so where were we up there? Okay, so we've gotten through about three paragraphs. Let's see. Okay, so we've gotten through several paragraphs. We've made it all the way down through figure one, which is a huge step. Um, and I think this explains it. Now, let's review this. You notice there's no muzzle blast mentioned here anywhere. This is strictly a phenomena that's created by the bullet. And as this bullet travels, it's continually creating the leading edge of this cone at the speed of the bullet. Not at the speed of sound, but at the speed of the bullet. And is, it is that precise phenomenon that causes the angle. Because once these shock waves created by the bullet detach from the bullet, they can't go any faster than the speed of sound, so they lag behind the bullet, and they for and and the the angle here is determined by that ratio of the speed of the bullet to the speed of sound, and I'll do a, a 3D visual show you exactly what happens uh, soon. Okay, and as the bullet slows down, the cone spreads out to the point where at Mach 1, i.e. at the speed of sound, the velocity of the bullet is the speed of sound, the, the cone would turn into a line going up and down, and everybody ahead of the bullet would essentially uh, intersect that at the same time. I think that's a true statement. Let me think if I got up there. Well, as long as they're equal distance from the front of it. Just as here, if this microphone was rotated down and it occurred along this line, it doesn't matter where along that line, the time of arrival would be identical, regardless of the distance between those microphones. And that's going to become a very important factor when we start looking at the actual lags. And if you recall figure 6 from the first video where I did the lag map, it's one of the reasons that um, the zones are the shape that they are because on each side of the trajectory of the bullet there's going to be the possibility of having the same uh, lag and it's also possible that the time of arrival of the shock cone is going to be identical for for any number of uh, recordings that are that are located parallel to the to the shock wave front. Yeah, that's a lot of terms. All right. So, what does all this mean in terms of the recording? We're going to go into that now. Okay. The, the acoustic shock wave wave. 
All right, let's back up a moment here. The acoustic shock wave from the bullet. All right, sorry, I had to pause there for a minute. Okay, so we're talking about a, a one wave from the bullet. All right, so let's back up here a minute. As in the cone, the sonic cone here, is a huge thing. It occurs all along the bullet, and it stays. And while it expands out and, you know, reduces in intensity, um, it's always, it's there. I mean, it, it's huge. You know, just like a muzzle wave, we have this ever-expanding sphere, and we talk about the fact that uh, when that sphere encounters your ears, you only hear a really small portion of it. The same is true for this sound, this cone, that the uh, how much energy is uh, intercepted by these microphones is, is is relatively small compared to the size of this cone, which is you know al along the entire length of the uh, the bullet. And you're not interpreting the whole. Th you're not in you know. It doesn't encounter you as the whole cone. You only hear this tiny fraction of it that is right here where it would intercept that. And then for this one out there, it would actually intercept a different portion along a slightly different path to the bullet. So these two things would actually here record different portions of this, the wave front of the shock cone. And so we refer to that as, as a shock wave, not the shock cone but a shock wave because it's only a small portion all right tricky devil isn't he yeah 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 so the shock wave from the bullet has a very rapid rise to a positive overpressure yeah 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 okay more terms to define positive means above zero um, overpressure means that we're increasing the pressure in the nearby region greater than atmospheric pressure. So whatever the barometric pressure is that day, when the bullet comes along with this shock wave, locally around the bullet, it increases the pressure. Because after all, you got to get the air out of the way for the bullet to pass through. So some, but something has to give somewhere. It's kind of like, you know, running through a crowd. You have to compress the people out of your way. And that's what we call an overpressure because they're you know, squished together. And it has, uh, so anyway, uh, it has a very rapid from whatever the signal was prior to it to the maximum. And then it comes down, he calls it, followed by a corresponding hmm, a corresponding under pressure. So anyway, it ramps down here to the bottom and it has a very similar looking thing, only this time it's on the negative side. So this is the under pressure, this is the over pressure, this is the transition between the two, this is where it starts, this is where it ends. And this is what the signal will look like, or the uh, recording of the bits of the sound on your device. And we'll see this in a waveform plot as we did in um, video one. Uh, but this is a very short phenomenon here. Anyway, uh, overpressure, so we'll talk about that. As the shock wave propagates the nonlinear behavior of the air, nonlinear. Okay, what does that mean? Um, nonlinear means approximately not in a straight line. It means that things don't react one for one, that a simple push could produce massive results or vice versa a massive push could produce simple uh, consequences so it's not nonlinear non one for one it's kind of like a a bowling ball rolling down a bowling alley hits the first pin and causes a nonlinear effect okay Uh, okay, so nonlinear behavior of the air causes the pressure disturbances to form an N shape. Ah, yes, N. We're going to get down to that definition. Good thing. With a rapid onset, 
very quick uptime, a ramp to minimum pressure, this is positive over pressure here, ramp down meaning that's pretty much a straight line there. Might be at an angle but it's you know pretty much linear. <laughs> And this kind of looks like a straight line, but nevertheless, it is a nonlinear process. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Rapid onset. Onset is another keyword here. Onset meaning beginning of. Okay, this is the onset right in here somewhere. This is the onset and this of the the signal, and this is the onset of the maximum overpressure. There, that's the maximum really. Anyway, so anyway, it has a uh, rapid onset, quick, nice linear ramp down and then a very quick um what is he what does he call it oh and then an abrupt offset oh well so the thing to note here is that you know it's kind of a, a semi-symmetrical thing in this case and you'll notice also here that there's something going on afterwards which we'll talk about later and the time interval interval meaning you know something to something uh, of the end wave between the over and under pressure so that's from here to there is proportional to the size of the projectile okay that's fair enough so the distance between here and there as the bullet gets bigger so distance is this way increases so the bigger the bullet the wider the wave and essentially it's measuring how much uh, air you have to move out of your way it takes longer for the more air you have to move. Okay, so a typical bullet of a few centimeters long, which a 223 is, yeah, uh, not very many centimeters long, has an intershock interval, that distance again, of, of a less than 200 microseconds as shown in figure two. Okay, 200 microseconds. In this case, we got milliseconds, so this is a 100, 200, 300, 400, okay, so each one of these is 100, so from here to, it would have to be there, would be 200 microseconds, so he's talking about from here to there, as shown in figure 2. Bottom line is that if we had a, a, a uh, controlled environment, uh, and a known quantity then we could get a real nice clear signal here uh, but let me tell you you're rarely going to get such a pristine signal in any of the recordings from that evening alrighty here we got another picture to go over looks good now this is you know an, an elevation 2d elevation of a, of a 3d phenomena so in this case, you know, up here we had the kind of a top viewer plan view as they call it. We're looking down from the top and here we're looking at it from the side. So the microphones are again are placed here. They're mounted a little distance above the ground and here's the trajectory of the bullet and from this diagram I can't tell whether the bullet's coming out of the page at us or going into the page. But maybe you'll tell us. Oh, it even says this is an elevation view. Oh, and he says it's bullet into the page. Huh. Give him, give him an A. Give him an A for, give him an A for description. Okay, so the bullet's moving away from your face into the page, and continues on. And we have some shock wave, an expanding shock wave out there. So it starts out small, moves to here, moves to there, moves to there, and moves to there. Okay, and that will move from the center to these microphones along that path but it, this wave goes out in all direction literally even though it's propagating along a line and uh, some of those waves will hit the ground or some portion of that shock wave will hit the ground reflect back up and head over to the microphone so we're going to get two signals is what he's saying it's going to be two different versions of this Okay, so, and they're going to arrive at this microphone sometime different from that because this microphone would uh, intercept a, a reflection that would come from about over there. And that path to there was going to be a little bit longer than this path. 
Okay. Tricky business. Okay, so bottom line on that one is for one bullet, uh, we're going to get two signals. It's going to be two signals that are kind of like this. Reflections lose some energy, so it's going to have smaller amplitude. And because it's all ref no, no reflections are perfect, it's going to be fuzzier and a little bit shaped a little bit differently. Let's see what he has to say. I uh, get a crick in my neck on this one. Oh yeah, we got a little bit to go on this one. Okay, so he's got this Winchester 30 caliber rifle, and he's firing it parallel to the ground and uh, perpendicular to the plane of these microphones. All right, so we talk about these microphones, omnidirectional microphones, meaning that each microphone can receive and re receive sound from all directions. Omni. Okay, and the the bullets going parallel to the ground away from us, and at 90 degrees to the microphone, which means that you didn't fire over here, it didn't fire over there. It fired straight down this page, and and these microphones are conveniently, conveniently um, perpendicular to that that shock wave up here the same picture isn't perpendicular to the shock wave um, shock wave front travel but down here that same little thing is perpendicular he claims to the shock wave so you see you have to be really really careful here a shock wave and the conic wave front aren't always the same thing and you have to be very careful about the words you use because it can be kind of confusing. Alright. Okay, they're mounted one foot apart and 1.6 meters above the ground, that's good to know. The rifle was fired from shoulder height, approximately 1.6 meters, same height as the speakers, which that gives them this nice perpendicular angle even if you're looking at it sideways okay and the microphones are located uh, 20 feet downrange from the gun oh wait a minute let's see they're 1.6 meters above ground Yep. At a distance, at a distance of 6.3. Yeah, downrange, that's what it is. The bullet crossed the microphone plane. The bullet. The bullet crossed the plane, crossed the microphone plane, which would be this, this direction. The plane here would be looking into this like a, just like the ground surface, but up here at a distance of 3.7 meters. Okay, so from the here to the plane of the uh, microphones. Maybe I'm misreading that. Um, yeah, I am. Okay, in this case he's referring to the plane of the microphone as this. So the pole and he measured it from this one, so this would be up and down. That would be the plane of the microphone. And from there to there was uh, 3.7 meters. This one, the nearest one. Okay, we've got that straight now. Okay, the bullet speed for the particular ammunition used was 2728, 2728 feet per second, and the speed of sound was 1,075 feet per second at 20 degrees. Oh, this guy works in the cold. <laughs> And the resulting Mach number was 2.54, okay, which gave an angle of 23.2 degrees. Okay, so this little angle right here is going to be 23.7 degrees. Okay, let's see. The geometry is shown in figure 4. Oh, goody, another picture. Uh, the predicted, meaning if all this stuff theory is correct, 
then then uh, what we're going to see first is the bullet speeding away from the muzzle along path. Oh, I'll just go down here and look at this. Okay, so here's the gun. Here's the microphone. This is the top view or plan view. Yeah, plan view. Nothing's to scale, of course. Nothing's ever to scale, is it? Okay, and we got the bullet traveling along here. 3.7 meters from there to there. Uh, 6.3 meters there. So these microphones are fucking close to the gun. That's going to be a loud recording. In fact, for most of us, with our mobile phones, that might be kind of dangerous. 20 feet away from the barrel of the gun, and, uh, 20 feet down range, and uh, 12 feet cross range? Oh, hell yeah. That's going to be loud. Okay, so I'll give you my version of, of, of what this is. The muzzle blast it comes from the barrel of the gun, prop, uh, propagates outward in all directions as a sphere, and the path it takes to the left microphone is this path. Okay. The bullet, on the other hand, comes here and zips down this line. At some point, it's continually generating shock waves, and collectively they form the shock cone wavefront which is traveling at 20 which is which are these little lines here a whole family of lines when the head of the head of the sh cone was there uh, this this wave that was created at the muzzle was already here and that rep that's what this line represents is is where the um, shock cone is the leading edge of the shock cone is when the bullet is at the corresponding thing. So for when the when the head when the bullet's here, then the shock cone created back here is out there. Okay. When the bullet is here, the shock cone is along is the leading edge of the shock cone is right there. So the real question is when do when do these microphones hear or intercept that shock cone? Well that would be this line. And the bullet by the time uh, the shock wave or the leading edge of the shock cone hits this thing, the bullet is fucking gone to hell. It's way up there. Okay, so then the question becomes, well, which, where along the trajectory of the bullet is that shock wave, not shock cone, generated that hits this? And it really has to do with the fact that the minimum distance from the microphone to that point is perpendicular or 90 degrees to this family of curves here. Okay, so no matter where this point is, it has to be 90 degrees to any and all of those those um, places where the shock cone was, or in this case is when it's recorded. Um, so, in this case, the bullet comes. So, in determining when the when the shock cone, shock wave arrives here, you have to take this time from the, the gun barrel, the travel time at the speed of the bullet till it hits till it reaches X, and and the shock wave generated there will propagate outwards in the same direction, or the, actually the shock front, the uh, shock cone leading edge, or, or will propagate this direction along that path till it hits there. So the time at which it gets here is the sum of this distance divided by the speed of sound plus this distance divided by the speed of the bullet. Easy, right? Yeah, they say easy. No problem. <laughs> I wished. As opposed to the uh, muzzle blast here which is going to take this path because after all that's the least distance from the barrel to there that's the shortest path uh, divided by the speed of sound so you got two calculations involving the speed of sound this path and this path and one calculation involving the speed of the bullet here so muzzle is easy you know you can just take the Pythagorean distance from this point to that point and divide by the speed of sound and you got the time of arrival 
can't do that for this little puppy because you got to figure out where this position is and you do that by taking some trigonometric transformations based upon the position of this microphone and the time of arrival and working backwards or forwards depending upon what, what you're trying to do. So let's see what he says. And how much more? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, gee, man. Christmas. This gets a. I'm going to speed it up a bit. Okay. So we already determined that the mock angle was 23.2. We just looked at figure four and I told you briefly what it's about. Okay, so now we're going to see how he phrases it. The predicted uh, acoustic result begins with the bullet speeding away from the muzzle. Duh. Along path A, just like we said. Whoop. Uh, at more than 2.5 times the speed of sound. So, in other words, to travel these few feet here, it doesn't take very long. Uh, uh, trailing, it's 23.2 degree. Now, whenever an engineer starts giving you three digits of accuracy, you know there's some good measurements going on. Uh, shock, wave, cone. Okay, it's trailing it. By trailing this, it doesn't mean heat the bullets behind. It means that the shock cone is, is trailing the, the bullet. That's all well and good. The shock wave front itself expanding outward from the bullet's path at the speed of sound. That's all what we know. Because uh, we can go way back up here and look at that. You know, Here it is. The cone is speeding away from the bullet trajectory at the speed of sound. Because once, once the shock wave leaves the bullet itself, or actually it's the other way around, once the bullet leaves the shock way behind, you know, it can only travel at the speed of sound, but it's creating new ones at the speed of the bullet. Alrighty. Back down. Uh, so we covered path A. The shock wave front, referring to the cone itself, expands out, is expanding outward from the bullet's path at the speed of sound. Duh. Will propagate away from the bullet's course in a direction parallel to paths B and B prime. Okay, B and B prime. Uh, where we go? Where's B? Hello. Oh, here's B prime. And here's B. You said parallel to those? Perpendicular. It should be perpendicular, right? Uh, let's see. The shock wave front itself expanding outward from the bullet's path at the speed of sound will propagate away from the bullet's course in a direction parallel to paths B and B prime. That's kind of a confusing statement. In a direction parallel to those. In a direction. What's the direction? Okay. Let's let's go down here. The direction of the sh cone's propagation is this way. Yeah, I guess you could consider that parallel. Yeah, that's parallel because the shock cone is expanding outwards in this direction, and it's uh, you know all along these lines, so it's expanding out all those. And B and B prime are parallel to the width, the direction in which it's expanding. Okay, that's good. So we got that. Um, the shock wave ray. Oh golly, here he introduces another term. Shock wave ray. All right. See, this is where it gets technical. You got the shock cone with the shock cone wave front, and then you got the shock wave, and now we got the shock wave ray that reaches the <coughs> that reaches the microphone is launched. Okay, so what he's basically saying here, he's got to invent some new terms to describe a phenomena which is fairly complex, and I agree with that. How the wavefront is created by, uh, basically it's created by the interaction of, of every time the bullet just moves a little bit, creates a new shock wave. That shock wave is the same as the muzzle blast in terms, of it's, it's an ever-expanding uh, sphere, and those spheres all interact together to produce uh, a... Uh, a, a front called the shock cone wave front that is at an angle. But if you want to know which shock wave is received at the microphone, you have to talk about the shock wave, which is really nothing more than a miniature muzzle blast uh, that was created at the speed of sound and propagates, I mean, created at the speed of the bullet and propagates at the speed of sound. So that's what this shock wave ray is. So really what we're going to ask is there's this shock 
wave that's a sphere that's created along the path at some point we're trying to determine which one of those trillions of little uh, ever expanding spheres are that's going to intercept the microphone that's what we're that's what we're asking all right okay he says so the shock wave ray that reaches the microphone is created or launched however you want to read that when the bullet reaches position x yeah that's okay that's a valid enough statement thus the total time between the gunshot and the shock wave arrival at the microphone consists of the bullets time of flight at velocity v from the muzzle to point x true plus the ensuing shock wave ray okay so let's uh, let's go down here so that everybody knows what we're talking about he says basically what i said before the that the time to get to this point l which is where the shock the sphere the shock wave which is an ever expanding sphere here to there first you have to get there to create the the sphere and that will happen you can go from here to there which along this a path uh, at the speed of the bullet so whatever that distance is divided by that Mach number and that's a time and then you go from here to here then the sphere creates and it takes a while to expand out to there and that happens along that path at the speed of sound so you take B and divide it by the speed of sound and you get the time to go from there to there and you take that time and this time add them together and that's when it arrives at L that should be clear enough right <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, I've got a program which generates these diagrams for me for any combination of uh, location. I'm currently working on expanded into 3D, uh, but for 2D situations, I can produce something very, very similar with all these calculations in a table format. And I'll show that in one of the, the upcoming videos. Okay, so where were we? Reading. That's what we're reading. Shock wave ray. What's the shock wave ray? This thing. So he uses the term shock wave ray to describe the sphere that was created here that it expands out to there. Okay. Very good. Okay, that reaches the microphone, is launched there. The total timeline. Geometric okay, let's see along. Uh, geometrically, this total time is equal to the propagation time at the speed of sound along path B prime. Oh, I hadn't really thought about that. <coughs> I calculated a different way. I calculated by figuring out where the bullet theoretically had to be. I'm gonna have to modify my program. Okay. He's saying that the time it takes the bullet to travel there, and then this this little new shock wave created to try plus the time there is equal to the time it would take something to travel b prime what which what what's traveling b prime this total time is equal to the propagation time at the speed of sound along path b prime oh ooh, that's going to make my program a little simpler i hadn't realized that okay so this distance divided by the speed of sound is equal to this distance at the speed of the bullet plus this distance at the speed of the sound sound and to calculate that oh yeah that'll be a little easier hmm. anyway that's all good all right okay there we are. The ground reflection of the shock wave ray. So this sphere that was created here, it's traveling in all direction. It travels. Yeah, there, I hate that word. It propagates in all directions, and some portion of it propagates straight across to the microphone. Uh, another portion of it propagates down towards the ground, hits the ground, and reflects back up. So we'll call that the shock ray reflection. We'll propagate at the same azimuth as B. This is a new revelation for me. Same azimuth. Oh, I see. That just simply goes back to this picture up here. Um, and uh, this 
path and this path all form a plane that is perpendicular to uh, the trajectory of the bullet going into the page. Okay. Did you get that? All right, me too. Okay. At path B, same azimuth as path B, but along the longer path from the muzzle. Oh, wait a minute. This is something different. Muzzle to the ground and back up to the... Oh, what? The ground reflection of the shockwave ray will propagate at the same azimuth as path B here, uh, but along the longer path from the muzzle to the ground and back. What? 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 I don't know. I don't know what that means. That doesn't make any sense to me. The ground reflection of the shockwave ray. Okay, at the same azimuth as path B. Well, of course, it has to get to the microphone, therefore it's got to have the same angle. But along the longer path, from the muzzle to the ground and back up to the microphones. Now, that's a typo. Can't happen. We're not going from the muzzle here. <coughs> Sound travels from the source to the destination. Actually, that's a bad term. Travels from the sound travels from the source to the point at which it's intercepted. In this case, there's a sphere being generated right here, as he shows by these circles, and he's just saying that this path is shorter than this path, and that this path starts at the same point, propagates down towards the uh, uh, ground, back up to the microphone, and it's longer. That's all he's saying. So that was a typo. Yeah, you know, you can't believe everything you read. Okay, the sound of the muzzle blast itself will travel directly from the gun to the microphones along path C. Yeah, we already covered that. Shortest route possible. No problem. Simple calculation if you can do trigonometry. Okay, the ground reflection of the muzzle blast, however, arrives later due to the longer propagation distance from the muzzle to the ground and then back up to the microphones. Uh, same phenomena we had as, as up here, but at this time it's for the muzzle different angles too. Okay, the predicted propagation times for the shockwave and muzzle blast arrivals at the microphones are shown in table one. You know, this is where I cop out and say that's going to be left as an exercise to the reader. I don't know if the values in there are correct or not. What I'm interested in is uh, what it looks like because that's what I deal with all the time is what it looks like and then I can make measurements and work backwards. Okay, so we got a two-channel recording. Yes, we got two microphones. Uh, obtained from this configuration as shown in figure five. Oh, goody, another figure. Uh, in most of my analysis, I start with a single channel because a dual-channel uh, signal applied to a Fourier transform, which is a conversion from the time domain to the frequency domain, or we're, instead of measuring amplitudes of waves here, this would show up in a, a, a graph of frequency versus time, which gives me a, a much, much better idea of, of what we're dealing with. Um, I really want don't want to have all the complexities involved because you see there's going to be overlapping signals here because of the two channels presented in the in the Fourier transform or the spectrogram and if I leave out one of these channels then I've got a cleaner uh, image to deal with. Okay. Alright, two channel. Two channel recording obtained from this configuration is shown below. Using the arrival of the initial shock wave which always hits first as the time reference. Okay, so we're going to measure everything relative to the t start of the first shock wave. Uh, the measured time intervals and the percent discrepancy between the measured and predicted values. Is, oh, oh, there's some errors, huh? On the order of a maximum of four percent. And a, a day, oh, actually, so the absolute gap here is 3.8 plus 1.7 is 4 is 5.5 percent. Whoa, shit, that's big. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see why it's big. So, just like I did in my tables, they measured some stuff. 
Okay. And they measured it. And this is how much it's off from the predicted theory. Okay. The microphone signals were digitized with a 48 kilohertz sample rate. Eh, that's not quite enough to be real accurate. Maybe that's the problem. Need to go up to 128 kilohertz for th this type of of high frequency, high slew rate. Slew rate means how quickly it jumps up. Uh, oh yeah, he says that if I record it 48 kilohertz, then the smallest amount of time difference I can measure is, uh, let's see, that would be 20 microseconds, or two one hundredths of a millisecond, or 20 millionths of a second. Okay, so let's see how, what are they trying to measure here? They're trying to measure, which if we try to measure, let's say, two milliseconds, and we're off by two one hundredths, then yeah, there's two percent introduced there just because we're using a 48 kilohertz signal. So we'd have to at 128 kilohertz, which is about um, three, a little more than three times, or about three times. Then we could reduce that error down to uh, about two over three. So yeah, so 128, 128 kilohertz is good, and it would get us you know enough accuracy to measure these to eliminate most of that air. So what's that tell you about if we're using a 44 kilohertz signal to measure these things that we're going to have built into it upwards of a 5% error. That's good to know. Okay. So let's take a look at this. That's interesting. Okay. The things you notice here is that shock waves are, are narrower in than muzzle blasts. In this case, the shock wave had a lower amplitude than the muzzle, and that's because we're so close. The, uh, the, the, the muzzle blast is a huge explosion, and it can be upwards of 170 decibels, which is past the pain of threshold. That's ear damage. And the shock wave, on the other hand, is for each shock wave, it can be up to, let's say, realistically, 100, well, for a 308, it's more, probably 144 decibels. So 170, subtract 144, let's do 140. 100, that's 30 decibels, which is uh, 10 to the power of 5 in terms of perceived louder loudness. It takes... Did I do that right? It takes six decibels to effectively double the volume, let's say. And so if we have 30, then it's a factor of five. So it's going to sound, these signals are, are probably going to sound five times louder. And I'm not sure what the actual decibel value is there. I guess we could look at it. Huh? Let's see, 0.2 versus point. Oh, no, that's only two to one. So... Since this one's wider by a factor of three, and it's twice the amplitude, so we're gonna go. Back. That's probably gonna be perceived at ten times. It has ten times the impact. So let's see. So it's gonna be. Um, hmm, my math's a little off. If it's ten times, that's be one decibel. No, it doubles for every six decibels. And we're ten times, so that'd be three bits. So somewhere between six and eight times louder than that. So in this case, the muzzle blast is going to dominate. Kind of a hard calculation, mentally, for me, anyway. Oh, that was a slam, slam, wasn't it? Anyway, let's look at it. We're going to read about it, aren't we? No, he's just saying here that there's good agreement there. Well, you know, I guess so. It could be better. 
but he's only using the 48 kilohertz sampling rate, so which really can only measure down to 22 because of the Nyquist frequency. It can only really measure down to 22 kilohertz. Okay. So now let's see what he has to say about all this. Oh, now here's a different case where we see a big shock wave and uh, a littler muzzle. Okay. If the muzzle of the gun is pointed away from the microphones at an angle such that the shock wave cone does not reach the microphones, then only the muzzle blast will be observed. That's technically true, uh, but there's a flaw there. And the flaw is that no matter if you have that the the first few, uh, it takes a bunch of shock waves along the trajectory trajectory of the bullet to create a wave front a straight line essentially at an angle to the uh, bullet traveling and this is getting very complex now this is the details of how that wave front is created but anyway so for the first couple shock waves the individual shock waves along the trajectory of the bullet that are will eventually come together and form a shock wave front those first few ones <coughs> they're a sphere and they're going to propagate as a sphere does out the back of that cone and while just a few of them together is going to be almost inaudible they're there and at close recording distances even behind the gun you're still going to get this little minuscule signal not any distance forget it so techni uh, technically uh, correct but not completely true all right only the muzzle boss be hurt but we can use that to our advantage in that if there's no recorded um, sonic wave or a shock, if there's no recorded shock wave, then the gun is probably pointing away from us, or we're at at least a 90 degree or better angle to the muzzle. Okay, so the muzzle blast sound appears to be highly directional. Yes. Figure six. Are we on figure six? Where do we? Have? Figure six. Okay. Uh, shows the acoustic recording obtained when the bullet's trajectory passes very close to the microphones causing a shock wave reflection and the muzzle blast to arrive essentially simultaneously in both channels of the microphones. Okay, well, now we're talking about how the signal looks relative to the angle of, of your position to the gun. And that is a big problem. Um, you know what, I think I'll leave the rest of this uh, reading uh, to another video, so let's wrap it up here. But as you can see, that it gets complicated signal-wise pretty quick, but I've given you enough uh, information and reading of this paper right now uh, to know that, you know, the recorded signals are going to look something like this with the amplitudes different. You're going to have, there's for every round that's fired, there's there's two, si two pieces Two, two signals that will be recorded. One is the shock wave, which generally arrives first, and then sometime later will be a muzzle blast. If the gun's pointing away from you, it's only going to be the muzzle blast. If you have uh, dual channels, you could get twice the signals. Uh, at distances close to to the gun, you know, the muzzle's going to dominate, but for the Vegas stuff, almost all of them are far enough down that uh, if you're close if you're in the venue, then the bullet's going to be closer than the uh, and produce a bigger sound than the muzzle. If you're out on the boulevard, it's going to be something like this, where the shock wave is still arriving first, but is of lesser amplitude than the muzzle, and therefore you're going to hear uh, the mu the muzzle mostly, and then somewhere in between you're going to hear them both, and then that causes all kinds of complication, and people start talking about. Uh, talking guns and you know and then you have to make papers but anyway I think I've covered enough for for this video and if your mind's not reeling by now uh, it should be but this this should give you uh, we've covered quite a few terms a couple of diagrams and you know if I repeat this ten times more then it's going to be uh, second nature in your brain and we're not going to get these questions like oh what does this thing that I heard that sounds like a crack mean? And you you will automatically say, hey, hey, that's the shockwave. 
dildo. No, you can't measure something from that because it wasn't generated at the barrel of the gun. It was generated along the path of the bullet. Don't give me this bullshit. It has to propagate all the way from the muzzle. It doesn't. So that's th that's the kind of knowledge that I want to impart so that people understand what they're hearing, why they're hearing it, and what it means. And correspondingly here... Oh, one more thing before I leave. Um, let's see, which diagram will be best? Uh, I guess we can use both of them. So let's pretend that you're one of these microphones. And uh, you're facing into the page and straight ahead of you is the Mandalay Bay and this is the bullet that just went by you now the sound of the shock wave comes from the bullet and it comes from over here so when it goes by you or close to you or wherever you know you hear that shock wave being generated from you're going to, to look which direction you're going to look towards where the sound is coming from this way the Mandalay Bay is ahead of you so when Hoover uh, puts out a video that says, hey, look which way th these shots are coming from, the people look at the Lux, or I go, well, duh. But instead he uses it because I have an understanding of where the sound was generated. But instead, he denies that there's a, a shock wave there, and, and he's talking about the, th I think he was talking about the 308 caliber shots, if I recall correctly, which produce a bigger shock wave than the 223. Um, so I, I look at that and I go, that's ridiculous. I start writing that in a comment and of course now I'm blocked from the channel. <laughs> but you will understand what I'm talking about. That if you hear the shock wave or the su supersonic crack as it's called in, in most lingo and you're looking at the Mandalay Bay, it will come from somewhere left or right or above but you will have to turn away from the Mandalay Bay to estimate where that shock came from. And that's the takeaway. Now, I, and I want to qualify that by saying that the further away from the bullet you are, the less that's true. So if I'm out at the Oasis Apartments, for example, which is some thousand feet away from almost any bullet path, um, uh, let's see. So let's then you're going to have a situation. I have to I have to redefine it in terms of this. But if you're this left microphone, and this isn't the scale, obviously, but let's presume it were for the moment, and you ha and and uh, we see that the shock wave is generated at here, and the Mandalay Bay is right here. Let's say on the scale, you're looking at Mandalay Bay and the shock wave is generated at X, you're going to have, you're going to instinctively turn and look towards X, which is somewhere over here where the Luxor is. Okay? Now, if this goes out another, let's see, I think that's 3.7 meters, if it goes out another 300 meters, okay, then this point X moves closer and closer and closer to the barrel of the gun just by the geometry of the thing, such that the path to the shock wave, which is the time of travel, which would in this in this new case where you're at Oasis Apartments would be very, very small there, and then you have this travel time. So it's almost the same as the muzzle blast, and therefore the lag or the time of difference between when the shock wave arrives and the muzzle blast arrives is small. So the greater this angle right here between the two, the less the lag. And that's why when you see a recording of the same exact shot at the Oasis Apartments, and let's take the infamous Volley 7, you see a lag, you know, let's say 20 or 30 uh, milliseconds, but that same shot, when it's you're recording it over here at, let's say, uh, the sound booth, is going to be 400 milliseconds. Same exact shot, and it occurs simply because of this geometry. Things starting to make sense, aren't they? Okay, that's enough for the evening. Enjoy what I passed along, and I'm sure we'll cover it ten more times before this whole uh, rigmarole is done. Good evening.